good afternoon. I'm from Switzerland. This is Bettina Etter speaking. Um, I'm going to be moderating this session. Um, I'm senior migration, global migration governance manager um, for um, the Swiss Agency for Development and um, Cooperation of the Foreign Ministry of Switzerland. I hope you can all hear and see me well um, as I'm joining you virtually um, this, this afternoon. Um, good morning or evening, um, wherever you may be around the world. And um, apologies for the late start of this session, which I understand was um, is due to um, technical difficulties in the earlier sessions. And so um, I'd like to announce at the outset that unfortunately, we have lost one of our panelists because um, of this delay. The um, minister from Ethiopia had to cancel um, at short notice because he had, or she had, I'm sorry, prior prior commitments. And so um, we will only have um, five panelists, but that um, or four panelists that will allow us um, a bit more time for questions and comments from the floor. Although um, I am informed by the organizers that um, we should definitely come to a close of um, today's um, first day of the IDM by 6 p.m. Um, Geneva time. So in two hours time from now. So let me start with a few introductory remarks and then we'll go right into the panel discussion. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to welcome you to the session on enhancing migrants agency and contribution to the achievement of the sustainable development goals. The pandemic not only endangers the prospects of advancing implementation of the objectives set out in the 2030 agenda for sustainable development, but also threatens to reverse the progress achieved so far and further exacerbate existing challenges and vulnerabilities across every area. In working together to identify measures to respond to the pandemic, it is important that governments and the wider international community seize this crisis as an opportunity to reiterate their commitments to achieve the sustainable development goals and use their implementation as a means to create more resilient societies and to ensure that they can better respond to future crises. During the recovery um, of the pandemic from the migrants' contributions will be essential for the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals. Moreover, it's important to also look at how the economic contributions of migrants and diasporas are affected by the pandemic and then how they could be safeguarded in the future and during the crisis. In this vein, um, Switzerland was prompted to take action in light of the alarming estimates that were released by the World Bank back in April about the expected staggering decline in remittances by 20% or um, 110 US billion dollar, which equals almost 70% of global ODA in one year. Um, together with the United Kingdom and multilateral partners, including IOM, but also private sector and civil society partners, we launched the call to action remittances in crisis, how to keep them flowing. Um, the intention of this call to action was to raise awareness about the potentially devastating effects the decline in remittances will have not only on migrants and their families who depend on those flows, this income to um, cover basic necessities such as um, food, housing, education, but most importantly during a pandemic, um, healthcare. It also threatens not only individual households, but also um, poses a great risk to economic stability in many of um, in many low and middle income countries where flows um, make up a big fraction of, um, of, of finance um, that goes into to the books of these economies. Um, we all know the numbers, remittances are three times larger than ODA um, in normal times, 
they also exceed um, foreign direct investment. And so this is a significant, significant contribution to, um, to economies. And so um, a decline in remittances is potentially threatening to um, the progress of, of the SDGs um, and threatens people to, to fall back or even deeper into poverty. So the call to action um, calls on different actors in the system, like policymakers from governments, but also regulators and also partners from the private sector, like the um, remittance service providers themselves, to take measures to mitigate the effects of uh, the crisis on remittances and ensure that migrants um, can retain access to remittance services and remittances can keep flowing. Um, the part that still um, is, is able to be transmitted because, of course, um, we're aware that um, there's unprecedented unemployment involved with the crisis and those are, um, those are incomes that definitely um, will not be able to, this will, this will be, be a gap in, in the remittances um, that are usually being sent, but that's where it's most important that um, those flows that um, can still exist, um, can be maintained and, and deemed even um, supported. So it's important, um, for example, to ensure that uh, remittance service providers are declared as essential services, but also promoting digital solutions. Um, this is what the crisis has shown. Um, is, is there's definitely still a need there, including financial literacy and education, awareness raising among migrants on how to use these digital solutions, but also temporarily or um, permanently waiving or reducing transaction costs, but also ensuring that re remittance service providers remain liquid in these times and also considering the ease of um, regulatory um, pressures and, and challenges. So um, with, this, with this initiative, this policy initiative at global level, Switzerland and its partners um, are hoping to, to contribute to awareness and also action being taken of this one um, but important part of uh, migrants' contributions to sustainable development goals that are severely affected by the crisis. And so in this spirit, this session will address, um, among others, like the remittances, also questions about alternative work and entrepreneurship opportunities, reskilling and um, transnational elements of, of migrant workers. So in the next two hours, we will try to address some of the following questions, thanks to our panelists, and then also um, comments from the floor. Um, questions like, we know that migrants have great potential to help reinvigorate and fuel social and economic development during and in the aftermath of the crisis. So how are migrant skills and contributions considered in preparing to respond to the pandemic um, in different policies taken around the world? And also in an ideal post-COVID world, which policies would you like to see implemented to improve the economic situation and skill recognition of migrants? What actions can post-transit and origin countries take to promote financial literacy and safer remittances of migrants during and after COVID? And what is the role of the diaspora in educating members for greater financial literacy? Um, in which ways do you see migrants having the greatest impact on the achievement of the SDGs in a post-COVID world? I now would like to turn to our distinguished panelists and would like to invite them to share their views, but also discuss challenges and best practices in including um, skills in the response and recovery efforts, as well as perspectives on promoting migrant agency and encouraging migrant contribution to, to the SDGs. Um, I will briefly introduce the panelists before I pass them the floor for about 10 minutes. Um, and I really ask you to keep the time considering the delays that we're already facing. Um, I already noted that unfortunately the minister of Ethiopia um, is not with us anymore and um, I understand that uh, we will give the floor to Ms. Pauline Tamesis, the UN resident coordinator in Cambodia first because of the, um, the time difference. Um, also uh, now um, that we have to take into account because of the, the delay. And then um, 
just also uh, to tell everyone where we are located around the world. I understand that most of us are joining online, most of the panel, um, except for the last speaker from WHO who is in the room. So um, without further ado, I would like to, to turn my attention to the resident coordinator in Cambodia. It's my great pleasure to introduce you, Ms. Um, Pauline Tamesis. She holds more than 20 years of experience in development cooperation, policy development, advocacy, and management, both within the UN system and with other international organizations. In previous assignments, Ms. Tamesis served as Asia Regional democratic governance practice leader and practice manager and in anti-corruption policy. Um, Ms. Tamesis, we greatly appreciate you joining us, especially so late, um, even later than expected, and um, you have the floor for your comments. Thank you very much. Good evening. Thank you for the opportunity to be part of the International Dialogue on Migration. Uh, coming to you from the UN in Cambodia. As we all know, the COVID-19 pandemic has fundamentally changed the world as we know it. And in no other time in our generation's history have we all equally experienced the impact of restrictions on human mobility as, uh, uh, sorry, have we all equally experienced the impact of restrictions on human mobility and subsuming individual freedoms for the sake of public good. And no other group has been adversely affected by restrictions on human mobility as the migrant community. It is in this sense that I share three messages on enhancing migrants' agency and contributions to the achievement of SDGs. Message one, Cambodia is a young and highly mobile population. Migration is an important economic lifeline and a factor driving social mobility for families. With productive capacity and remittances they generate need to be nurtured and protected in an enabling environment that allows them to meet their basic needs, create savings, assets, and opportunities for their families, communities, and sending and host countries. Um, 60% of Cambodians are under the age of 35 and they are highly mobile in search for economic opportunities. And they want to be part of the prosperity resulting from two decades of 7% GDP growth in Cambodia. Over the last two decades, internal and cross-border migration has been one of the most significant drivers for transforming Cambodian society. On average, Cambodian migrants send back 200 to 250 dollars a month in remittances, which is a critical lifeline for millions of households helping families raise their living standards above subsistence. From a macroeconomic perspective, remittances is a major source of foreign exchange in Cambodia. Total remittances have grown from 444 million in 2010 to 1.6 billion in 2019. These numbers alone already point to significant contributions that migrants make to the economy. And migrant workers' remittances can spur economic development in poor migrant sending communities. However, a lot depends on the migrant workers' access to many transfer channels that are affordable and safe. It also depends on recipients households' capacities and opportunities to use the money for productive investment. And more importantly, remittances need to be channeled to a supportive macroeconomic and business environment with good governance systems in place conducive to optimizing this fund for productive investments. So some of the key actions, improve financial inclusion and literacy, some of those that you've already highlighted, bringing the unbanked into the formal banking system, reforming legal and regulatory frameworks, to increase transparency and competition in the remittance market and deploying digital technology for more effective and, and faster payment systems. Message two, public perception being recognized and having a voice matters. When migrants are valued as a part of the economy and society with their rights recognized in the past, it's the first step to giving them agency. 
When mobility is part of, of the fabric of an interconnected world, we create an enabling environment for migrants to be counted as contributors. How do we make this happen? One, facilitate their ability to access opportunities in a safe, orderly, and regular manner. And two, ensure that they have legal, health, and social protection required to lead secure, productive, and fulfilling lives. On the first point, uh, one way to ensure safe, orderly, regular migration is through bilateral agreements. The MOU between Cambodia and Thailand, for example, aims to formalize the status of Cambodian migrant workers in Thailand. The involvement of private recruitment agencies and employers in this agreement is crucial and contributes to reducing irregular migration as well as strengthening social protection of migrant workers. Another way is through international cooperation via the Global Compact, which enables governments to promote safe, orderly, and regular migration through effective practices in national migration governance. It also enhances international migration policy by ad addressing some of the gaps in the way states cooperate with one another. And the second point, the pandemic has shown us that the best way to prevent people from sliding back into poverty is through access to health and social protection services. The UN's efforts in Cambodia support the government to ensure that migrants abroad are formalized so that they can obtain benefits from former labor markets and social protection systems in the destination countries. We continue working with the Cambodian government to increase protection of migrants for the whole cycle of migration. For example, in reducing payments of migration services, complex procedures, and red tape. We also mainstream migration within certain policy areas to support recognition of their social and economic contributions and bring migration into the national and social development plan, as well as help set up more integrated social protection mechanisms. Message three, even without the pandemic crisis, migrants remain one of the most vulnerable groups and at high risk of being left behind. If we don't target their uh, needs, tailored measures are required to create economic opportunities for migrants as part of building back better from the, the pandemic. One example, Thailand hosts approximately 1.2 million Cambodian migrant workers, the largest among the top three destination countries for Cambodia. When Thailand began to close the borders in March, more than 115,000 Cambodian migrant workers returned home. The mass return had significant repercussions. Their return to Cambodia with no job meant that their families could easily slide back into poverty. Without support for alternate sources of income or livelihoods, returning migrants are unable to reintegrate into their community and forced to remigrate, increasing risks in illegal recruitment, human trafficking, and COVID transmission. In this case, some of the priority response actions that we took were on health and protection, as well as on livelihoods and expanding employment opportunities. At the policy level, we ensure that migrants are considered in the policy response and social economic recovery strategy to the pandemic. And at the programmatic level, we ensure that the poor migrant returnees are included in the ID4 system. This is the cash transfer mechanism to obtain emergency assistance. Other efforts included reskilling and upskilling, improving their access to employment services, and supporting micro and small medium sized enterprises, as well as expanding support services. To conclude, may I emphasize that these priority and practical actions are necessary to enhance migrant agency and the SDG achievement. So, first, ramp up efforts to formalize migrant workers in destination countries. Second, include migration in the government's socioeconomic recovery plan. Third, social protection, provide social protection to the returning migrants and livelihood support. And fourth, to re-emphasize what you started off with in your opening, Madam Moderator, support IOM's global call to action on remittances in crisis, how to keep them flowing. 
With these measures, we can take the necessary steps to turn this crisis into an opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Messi from Cambodia, for um, your very relevant points and um, for highlighting with the case of Cambodia um, the relevance of remittances um, in, in recovery and in keeping them flowing. Um, also, the question of public perception and how migrants are being included in, in recovery, um, social protection, health protection as an important point, and um, also addressing vulnerabilities upon return of migrants and creating economic um, opportunities, reintegration opportunities, and also including them in emergency measures like um, cash transfers. So thank you very much for these stimulating points on how to increase migrants agencies during and after the pandemic. And with this, I would like to turn to our second speaker, Her Excellency Viorica Dumbravianu. Um, I hope I pronounced your name correctly. She's Minister of Health, Labor and Social Protection from the Republic of Moldova. I would like to thank you for yielding your first um, speaking place to uh, Mr. Messis because of the time difference. And just as a quick introduction before I give you the floor, Her Excellency has served in diverse offices of the Moldovan government over the past 18 years, including an advisor to the President of the Republic of Moldova in the field of social development, as the Secretary of State for Social Assistance, Ministry of Health, Labor and Social Protection, and also as the Deputy Minister of Labor, Social Protection and Family. She also served many years as the head of Family Protection and Child Rights Policy Directorate in the Ministry of Labor, Social Protection and Family of Moldova. I am very honored to welcome you to this session, Excellency, and you have the floor to make your statement. International migration is a phenomenon that affects the population worldwide and it involves almost all countries throughout the world. Some countries of origin and others are of destination. The Republic of Moldova is not an exception and as a developing country we've been affected by the phenomenon of migration. In this context we welcome the IDM as a very suitable platform for migration policy. On this occasion, I'd like to thank the IOM for organizing this event and also for our long-standing cooperation. The COVID-19 pandemic has affected the whole world, having negative effects not only on the health of the population, but also on social welfare, which is why migration and protection of migrants is becoming an important topic on the agenda of world countries, given the fact that migration has grown throughout the pandemic. With the outbreak of, pand of the pandemic, migrants have become very vulnerable, encountering problems such as job losses, lack of resources, la loss of ho housing and difficulties with mobility. In the Republic of Moldova, the indicative number of migrants is approximately 800,000 individuals. They currently reside in more than 45 countries throughout the world. And in terms of migrants who left for employment, the number is some 325,000. The main destination countries are Russian Federation, Italy, Israel, and Greece. Therefore, based on the existing migration profile, the Republic of Moldova took all necessary measures to, in order to incorporate an integrated approach on labor migration management in line with the objectives in the Agenda 2030 for Sustainable Development Goals. The efforts of the Republic of Moldova are concentrated on supporting migrants in distress and ensuring their protection, undertaking reintegration measures and harnessing the potential of migrants and diaspora. The measures aim to prevent Moldovan nationals abroad from finding themselves in distress and ensuring their reintegration in the country, as well as attracting and transferring human capital through their work experiences, new skills and knowledge, 
and entrepreneurial ideas that we can assimilate back in the country of origin. In this sense, we involved the diaspora by attracting Moldovans who left for studies to return to the country and contribute to its development. At the moment, there are some 6,000 Moldovans studying abroad based on the treaties that Republic of Moldova has concluded with other states on social dialogue in the area of social security with destination states of Moldovan citizens, I would like to highlight that we are currently discussing and negotiating with the Russian Federation, Spain and the Hellenic Republic so that in the near future we can sign treaties on the subject. However, in the context of nationals returning to the country, the pension rights acquired in the territory of destination countries can be capitalized. So far, the Republic of Moldova has signed 14 social security agreements, 13 of which have been successfully implemented. In the meantime, it is intended to provide economic support to members of the diaspora through developing and implementing various economic empowerment programs, such as PARE 1 plus 1, Diaspora Engagement Hub, DAR 1 plus 3, and these programs aim at supporting people from diaspora to implement projects in the country to improve infrastructure in rural and urban areas, to harness human potential and contribute to knowledge transfer. They'll be used with the aim of contributing to the overall development. It's important to mention that in the context of the pandemic, when a large part of our fellow citizens returned to the Republic, we adopted additional measures to support them because they didn't work in the country, they were not entitled to unemployment benefits in case of job loss. We provided benefits to the amount of 2,775 lei per month to overcome the difficult situation. Their access to social services for returned citizens has also been increased. We believe the skills and material resources of Moldovan migrants who are forced to repatriate because of COVID-19 need to be valued as major contributions for the development of the home country through the setting up of appropriate policies, programs and conditions. This year we have developed, with the support of IOM, a mechanism for validation and certification of informal skills migrants gained abroad. Diaspora has already mobilized itself in providing COVID-19 response by delivering support for vulnerable groups in Moldova and in, within the diaspora. Their contribution through knowledge and skills transfer, entrepreneurship and innovation, trade and investment will prepare the ground for a swifter socio-economic recovery after the impact of the COVID-19 crisis. We value the data and analysis drawn from important IOM-led instruments, such as the Migration Governance Indicators, UN Migration Network, Extended Migration Profiles, DTM Surveys, and now we need to act, addressing mobility-driven COVID-19 development impacts on the Republic of Moldova and in contributing to an early recovery by the impacted groups. I am convinced that this 20th, 20th edition of the IDM will greatly foster cooperation, partnerships and networks for future practical and relevant action in these challenging times. Thank you. Your Excellency, thank you very much for exploring with us the case of Moldova and how um, the government of Moldova is very actively um, integrating migrants and its diaspora in the response to the pandemic and also um, recovery plans, both um, supporting migrants abroad in distress, but also um, seeing to their um, effective reintegration um, for those who are returning and also um, the investments in transferring the skills, the human capa um, capital of your migrants abroad for um, the response and recovery um, of uh, in in this um, in this crisis. Um, thank you very much for for sharing your views um, and experience in your specific country. And um, I would now like to turn to our next speaker, 
who is Mr. Felipe Munoz, Chief of Migration Unit um, at the Inter-American Development Bank. He has previously served as the advisor of the President of Colombia for the Colombian-Venezuelan border, and he has served on the Inter-American Development Bank's Board of Directors. I'd like to welcome you to today's discussion on the agency and contribution of, of migrants, and we're keen on hearing your perspectives on this subject. You have the floor, Mr. Munoz. Thank you. Señor Eter, muchísimas gracias. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Eter. I'd like to thank the IOM and in particular Mr. Vitorino, the Director General, and all of the team at the IOM in the Latin America and Caribbean region for the support that they provide us with the migration process. I work at the uh, Migration Division of the Inter-American Development Bank and it shows the commitment that we have under our recently signed MOU. For those who are not familiar with the uh, Inter-American Development Bank, we are a major source of uh, loans and uh, financing in the region for Latin America. The subject of migration is one that affects the region of Latin America. It's been more focused in other regions, but in recent years we have seen a massive growth of migration. Migration within the region, just to mention that with the latest figures from the United Nations, we've had 5.4 million Venezuelans who have had to leave their country, and of them more than 80% are located in the region in addition to migratory flows within Central America, the Caribbean region, and throughout the region. So this uh, forced uh, migration can lead to uh, failure in achieving various sustainable development goals, be they on poverty, on eliminating hunger, and so forth. And that's why we have been adding the my subject of migration to the social part of the bank to ensure that we can help with managing the migratory process. I'd like to talk about some of the challenges we face and some of the potential within the recovery from the pandemic. As you know, more than 50% of employment in Latin America and the Caribbean is informal in nature. And this percentage is that Almost 70% of all migrants that are inter-region, within the region, are working in the informal sector. As you know, COVID-19 particularly affected these sectors, the services sector, the sectors of tourism and uh, assistance. And this is where the migrants were concentrated. So the uh, unemployment rate within, mig um, within the migrant population is even higher than within the local population. And we can see this uh, within the bid. And uh, that is why we wanted to work with countries to improve this and to integrate work with the integration processes. We're looking at identification processes, assisting employment agencies in matching supply and demand, and helping the workers so that it can be seen what opportunities there are for migrants and to help in giving uh, value to the certificates and uh, qualifications brought from other countries. And so we want to, in this way, reduce work and reduce the barriers that exist for migrants. So, but why is it so important to integrate migrants? Well, it's because in most of the countries, intra-regional Migrants are often a population with high levels of education, such as those from Venezuela, but also from a productive age and younger. And in many cases, the labor force is not one which is competing with the local market. And so we need to expand uh, migration and document it and ensure that we make the best of the processes that the bank may be involved in so that we can ensure there's accreditation and that we strengthen systems in order to improve information within the employment systems in the region. 
So how do we as a bank do this? We have a migration unit within the social division and we provide uh, non-refundable resources to the countries and so that these can be made accessible with uh, the production of papers, regional dialogues and sharing with organizations such as the, IO, the IOM, the United Nations Agency, so that we can share best practices. And so to conclude, I would like to thank many of the uh, donors, Ms. Etta, since you are there. I'd like to thank Switzerland, the United Euro Union, the European Union, the United States, amongst many, because they're providing us resources that we can then leverage and create better synergies and support to governments and the communities through the process. The Inter-American Bank, as a source of financing, has placed migration at its the center of its agenda, a cross-cutting issue, so that we not only cover migrants, but we include them in all public policy for development so that we do not lose what was gained in working towards the sustainable development goals. Thank you very much. Senor Munoz, muchas gracias. Thank you very much, Mr. Munoz. I'd actually like to thank you for bringing our attention particularly to the issue of employment and how it's important to make sure that um, the different branches of a, of a government um, are talking to each other when it comes to employment, um, that it's not only important to <clears throat> include migrants or to, to cover inclusion from, um, from a social side, but also from, from day one, um, actually think about how migrants can be included in the, um, in the different um, employable sectors in employment policies and really from the outset um, mainstreaming or integrating um, responses uh, for migrants, um, including them in different policy areas relevant to the achievement of the SDGs and particularly um, in the employment sector where migrants uh, can make a difference, uh, but also recognizing that uh, the pandemic has affected many of the sectors where migrants are active and that it's all the more important now for um, the different uh, agencies within um, governments to, to speak to each other and uh, identify how migrants can be, how the inclusion of migrants um, can be maintained um, and, and, and be addressed. So um, thank you very much. And um, I already have the pleasure to announce the last um, speaker on the panel. And um, then I would turn it back to the um, moderator who's in the room for comments and questions. But um, now, last but not least, I would like to turn to Mr. Hugo Camara. He is present in Geneva, um, if my understanding is correct. And um, he is COVID-19 support pillar manager for the World Health Organization. Dr. Camara is a specialist on infectious diseases and he is part of the five Mauritanian diaspora doctors mobilized through IOM and the EU Emergency Trust Fund for Africa to fight COVID-19 in Mauritania. He works in the service of um, the pneumology for the Centre Hospitalité, um, Hospitalier Universitaire de Grenoble for <laughs> having to, to switch to, to French now, this um, threw me off a bit. And his research focuses on infectious diseases, respiratory medicine and pulmonology while working with patients with cystic fibrosis. So um, this is going to be a very interesting perspective um, that he is going to lend to the discussion very hands-on. And we are keen to learn from your very specific experience um, in this crisis. And, how your work um, relates to um, migrant agency contribution, understanding that you yourself are one of those um, people who are supporting the um, response and recovery in this pandemic. Um, so thank you very much for being with us and the floor is all yours. Um, bonjour. Good afternoon. So I'm going to speak French. 
it's much easier for me. First of all, I'd like to thank the IOM and all the organizers who have ensured that I can participate today to speak about my experience as a member of a diaspora and to help, and by help in the fight against uh, COVID-19, uh, which has affected the whole world and countries such as mine. What I'm going to say is maybe a little different to the previous speakers because I'm a clinician in the field and I've been working in France for 20 years. Up until June, I was based in Grenoble where I was responsible for the Center for <coughs> Infectious Diseases. I decided in June to return to Mauritania. I was accompanied by five other members of the diaspora and they are still back there. And we were in, encouraged to do so through a program between the EU and the IOM. So to come back to the subject of the diaspora, what we need to remember is that there's always a continuous flow between members of the diaspora and their countries of origin. And these flows can be uh, more or less urgent. And for us, in our specific situation, we uh, lived through the first crisis of the pandemic in France, and in particular in Grenoble, where I was. And given the uh, depth of the comorbidities and the pandemic, it was really unprecedented in terms of coronaviruses. And we really wondered what would happen at home where the health resources are not uh, always there and uh, countries which are not really uh, structured in terms of their health systems. So the first idea was to uh, set up a contact with our countries of origin. And we did this through WhatsApp groups or we had various meetings in our case with the Minister for Health, uh, Zoom meetings where we started anticipating what equipment and resources would be needed. And so we shared the protocols for care, which were already available in the countries where we were living, our adoptive countries, uh, France in my case. So these concerns, which was always there, made us come to these country to the countries through this program in order to be able to share the experience that we had been through so that we could move ahead to the next steps and avoid mistakes that had been made and to be able to share with our countries so this commitment from the diaspora was uh, spontaneous and it was really facilitated by the IOM and I think ensured that we could have even more fruitful outcomes because of the uh, human resources, but also the technical uh, contributions we could make to our countries of origin. In terms of the COVID response in Mauritania, it was managed by the Ministry of Health, but with a great deal of support from various partners, in particular the United Nations system, which organized itself under the aegis of the World Health Organization, who employ us. So the World Health Organization is in charge of certain pillars, such as uh, the management of cases, and that's what I'm dealing with within the system. So we're really involved, uh, in particular in the field, with clinical activities and clinical services. We were involved with uh, health care coordination activities with the ministry and uh, activities for coordinating the mobilization of funds with the uh, technical and financial partners are uh, all linked to the WHO. So we, first of all, looked at setting up a database because we had to prove what seemed obvious through figures so that we could convince uh, those who needed to, to change their opinion and to look at this drama of the pandemic to working towards improving the healthcare system. So I'd like to speak very briefly about this uh, audit of deaths that we had to carry out because the uh, results are stunning. Until the 31st of August 2020, we had exactly 159 
death. So we were able to look at the number of deaths and we could see that the, the deaths uh, generally followed 24 hours after hospitalization. And we could see that in the field there was a great deal of uh, a lack of confidence in the healthcare system or mistrust. And so we were able to see how many people benefited from orotracheal treatment or invasive ventilation. And there we were able to see that only 20% of patients had oro, oral tracheal interventions. Uh, and we could see that uh, we could intubate patients, uh, but in Europe that happens maybe because the equipment's there. But uh, we found that there was a lack of necessary equipment. And that's applied to invasive uh, ventilation, obviously. And it was really only used in about 40% uh, of cases. Now, in terms of the involvement of the diaspora, we carried out a, a stock taking of all the structures that were hosting uh, COVID patients, including in the capital where we had uh, two uh, that could take uh, in COVID patients and also in the regions. We were able to look at all the diagnostic uh, algorithms and tools and we acted as consultants and made sure we were available for the health ministry above all. So overall, what I can really draw from this experience, which was extremely enriching for us, uh, those of us living abroad, uh, thinking we don't do much for our country. Well, this was an opportunity to do something and to contribute to our country, to dealing with this burden. So it was really an advantage. It was the main uh, benefit for me. Now, this program promoted by the IOM is very important because it above all concentrates on involving the Ministry of Health because in the field, uh, we can sometimes be, can be considered a little bit like NGOs, what's the WHO, it's uh, the IOM and so forth. But no, we were Mauritanians, uh, fellow citizens who came and made sure we were available for the WHO. Well, they were there backing us in terms of technical issues and logistics, but we were Mauritanians coming back and fighting the pandemic in our country because that that sort of changed the, the 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 fact that sometimes it was a little bit difficult where people said, well, he works for the WHO or whatever. But I think it's a good idea to encourage this type of uh, project and to carry them out and continue carrying them out in the future. And above all, it's important to involve the Ministry of Health. So I've tried to give you a quick summary because I was told I had between three and seven minutes because otherwise I could talk... All, all day about this, but if you have uh, questions on a practical level or you'd like to discuss how you and uh, want to know more, then I'd be more than happy to talk about it. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, Mr. Kamara. Thank you very much, Mr. Kamara, for having shared your experience. It's really very impressive. Excellent closing of our um, panelist part of, of um, this, this current section with, um, with an actual experience of a member of diaspora who was um, able through this um, program led by the IOM and um, supported by the EU to return to the country of origin and support the um, response to COVID. This is very impressive and um, Thank you for your service to, um, to your country. And uh, in this pandemic, people like you are the ones that are truly making a difference um, in this crisis. And um, I think it's um, very honorable um, what, what you did and what you achieved and very impressive to, to hear from you. Thanks for sharing your story. And um, now I would turn back to my sort of co-moderator in, in the room in Geneva, who will um, navigate through questions and comments from the floor. If we do have um, questions to some of the panelists, maybe um, we can hear a few and then go back to them. Um, otherwise, we'll just hear uh, statements and then 
um, once we're through the list, we can close this session. But um, Mr. Co-moderator, over to you to um, steer us through the interactive part of the, the session. Thank you. Many thanks, Bettina. I think we are free, have had a very interesting uh, panel three. And so far, we have a total of seven uh, people that actually request uh, the floor after the panel three. On my list, I have the first UNMGCI, then Ireland, then ADEPT, then Bangladesh, then Ecuador, Myanmar, Myanmar and Niger. Uh, first, I'd like to give the floor to UNMGCY. Please, the floor is yours. Do you have it? I just got an invitation the UNMGCY is not ready. Then uh, I'd like to Ireland to give the floor to Ireland. Please. Go ahead, please. We cannot, we cannot hear you. Can you try one more time? If not, then we can go for another. No, we cannot hear you. You are still silent. Okay, then let's go in the room. Uh, I would like them to uh, give the floor. Is the adept ready here in the room? It seems not. Uh, then uh, we have Bangladesh on the list. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Let me also thank the distinguished panelists for their very insightful presentations. Migrants are an engine of development in many developing countries. Migrants' contribution is explicitly tangible in the socioeconomic progress in countries of origin as well as of destination. Around 74% of migrants are of working age, despite comprising only about 3.5% of the global population, migrants contribute to about 10% of global GDP. In recent years, remittances to low- and middle-income countries, except for China, exceeded, remittances, uh, ex exceeded foreign direct investment flows. Hence, as countries embark on the journey to implement the SDGs, migrants can play a vital role in supporting the countries to reach these goals. Yet, migrants, irrespective of their status, have been among the most vulnerable in the face of COVID-19 pandemic. They have been at health risks while socioeconomic impacts on them also remain acute. With an estimated 20% drop of global remittances alone in 2020, the lifelines of millions of families in developing countries are already at stake. This has the potential to push many of the migrants' families into poverty. Hence, the efforts of the developing countries like Bangladesh to achieve the SDGs have been facing formidable challenges. However, these challenges are not insurmountable. Tackling them to ensure that our efforts to implement the SDGs are not jeopardized would require collective efforts globally. To this end, Bangladesh underscores the following steps. First, a 360-degree approach as stipulated in the Global Compact on Safe, Orderly and Regular Migration needs to be mainstreamed in all migrants and migration-related actions at the national, regional and the global levels. Second, a holistic and development-oriented migration governance which the GCM had introduced needs to be reinforced for the full implementation of SDG 10.7. Third, migrants' significant potential needs to be utilized in tackling this global health and economic crisis. 
Fourth, the COVID-19 may potentially transform the nature of future work. Migrants must not be excluded from the decent and productive jobs in the post-pandemic time. Fifth, countries of origin, in particular the developing countries, must be appropriately supported for sustainable reintegration of the returning migrants in their economy by creating livelihood provisions. I thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Bangladesh. Now I'll check one more time. Do we have no sound with Ireland, or we still have just a picture but no sound? Okay, it seems that we do have still issue with Ireland. Uh, then I would like to give the floor to Adept. I, please. Adept thanks the IOM for organizing this great event in these challenging times. And the center in thanking all the speakers this afternoon and in the morning sessions for all the concrete solutions that were presented, which were needed to protect the migrants and continue to enhance their contributions in the sustainable development goals as provided in the Agenda 2030. ADEPT observes with great interest the efforts of the international community and the UN member states to continue to engage and support the efforts and contributions of migrants and diaspora in their host and home countries. ADEPT has equally taken note from presentations and comments made in the sessions that migrants and diaspora are no longer seen just as cash cows that only remit money for household affairs in countries of origin, it is with interest that we note the recognition of diaspora contributions elsewhere in the social, technical, and development of SMEs, both in host and countries of origin, thus recognizing the diaspora as agent and stakeholder in the development process. As part of our recommendations, we do hereby first invite the diaspora community to remain steadfast in building the capaci their capacity and forging a united front to maximize their impact and make their voice heard in the development scene. Secondly, we also call on the countries of origin to continue to develop friendly policies capable to support and guarantee the safety of diaspora investments and entrepreneurship. Thirdly, the host countries are also encouraged to continue to engage, stimulate, and maximize their support towards the empowerment of migrants and diaspora communities, building their capacity to boost their technical and socioeconomic contributions in both host and countries of origin, irrespective of difficulties that might appear in the process. Indeed, no one is safe until everybody is safe. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Adept. And I would like to give the floor to UNMGCY, please, online. Hello. Um, thank you, moderator, for the floor and the panelists for such an, an intriguing discussion. Uh, my name is Emilia Picudi, and uh, I'm a young woman from Greece. Uh, I am talking as a youth representative on behalf of the United Nations uh, Major Group for Children and Youth. Um, my professional capacity relates to asylum procedures in Greece. Uh, with all today, I will be drawing from my particular um, experience in youth policies and youth programs focused on non-formal education for the past uh, about seven years. I have worked on numerous non-formal education projects in Greece, um, such as the European Union's education schemes, and also Mexico, the Caribbean, Turkey, Norway, and many other countries. And I have been part of the formation of uh, uh, youth policies at global events, uh, including the United Nations uh, Global Declaration or the Baku Commitment, and have interacted with youth communities in more than 80 countries in the world. Uh, most of uh, which uh, are coming from uh, conflict-affected or crisis-affected uh, communities. Um, to give you a feel of uh, what kind of non-formal education I'm uh, talking about and what is the potential to help young people and migrants become agents of change in their communities, I have worked in projects that uh, promote the exchange of good practices between youth workers, for instance, to work with media tools and digital tools, uh, to conflict transformation and peace buildings, 
in conflict affected communities or to include socially marginalized groups in nature conservation and disaster prone areas so as to both uh, integrate and generate income or projects that supported youth uh, with drug addictions to work in sectors like tourism and rural youth to build their own social enterprises. Uh, this is very effective as it creates uh, young agents and gives them the tools to become agile, to become agile and socially innovative in times of change and crisis going well beyond playing capacity building, training and reskilling and quantifiable elements of development as notion to hold. Uh, when talking about how to promote migrant ability to discuss and navigate through their indispensable potential as agents of change, non-formal education plays a multidimensional role. Uh, through its experiential nature, it is unique and it's contributional to building competences for youth to become critical thinkers, entrepreneurs, humanitarians and world citizens and in promoting values for social cohesion and resilience for post-crisis recovery and redevelopment where soft skills and agility are vital non-formal education shall be recognized for being an open source for communities in situations of crisis and be included in migration and development policies as a process and as an end goal it can set the ground for structured, reflective dialogue on mainstreaming youth migrants in the post-2015 development agenda, as it translates in local realities and dynamics. I'd like to share a couple of success factors to ensure this is effective. First, pay attention to heterogeneity of migrants and ensure that they are not targeted or siloed for this, not overlooked. Uh, intersectionalities and parallel identities, but that the process is inclusive of host communities too. This will aid social integration and create allies and synergies, but will also reassure active representation from ideation to implementation stages. Second, invest, utilize and partner with already existing programs and frameworks as they are already affecting, effective as once in place and can constitute a fruitful ground for the multiplication of uh, non-formal education impact across and between youth and migrant communities. Thank you. Have Christo. Okay, then uh, we will try for a third time, Mr. the Cronin from Ireland. Uh, can we now hear you? Is it working now? I hope so. Can you hear me, Mr. Chairman? Yes, we can hear you. Great, please go ahead. Thank you very much and um, greetings everyone from Limerick in Ireland. Uh, thank you for your patience with this technology, but it's great that we're able to connect. <clears throat> uh, I'd like to say that migrants have an essential role to play in contributing to the SDGs. That's very clear. Uh, and indeed it was underpinned in the explicit and the very important link between the New York Declaration in 2016, which Ireland co-facilitated and the Global Compact for Migration with the 2030 Agenda. Uh, Ireland is a country that has increasingly become, as you may know, a destination for migrants, but we have a long, long history as a country of origin. Uh, and because of this, I think Ireland understands the necessity of integration, how this helps countries of origin and destination. Over and over today, we are hearing how the COVID-19 context makes this even more important. A number of measures in Ireland I'd like to mention in that regard. We have ensured access to healthcare and social supports uh, for uh, people regardless of their legal status. Um, we are ensuring that policy responses taken during the pandemic have been inclusive of migrants, of ensuring that their agency uh, is central in any policy. Uh, we are granting automatic renewal of immigration permissions to ensure that people are not falling uh, out of status during this time through no fault of their own. And we're also ensuring equality of access to social welfare payments uh, and other social supports so as to provide income security uh, and not to ask questions which might debar people from benefiting. So by ensuring that the needs of migrants are met, we are not only affirming to them that they are valued members of our society, we're also ensuring that 
when this crisis is over, and let us remember uh, in the uh, current difficult circumstances that this crisis will pass, um, that migrants will be in the best possible position uh, to take advantage of the opportunities that become available. And by taking advantage of those opportunities, they will be in the best possible position, uh, should be our aim, to contribute to sustainable development in their countries of origin and destination. Uh, Mr. Chair, Ireland also places a lot of emphasis on engagement with and support to, and also benefiting from the large Irish diaspora overseas. Uh, we have a minister for the, the diaspora. We have a government diaspora policy, and we'll be very happy to share with others the ways and means that we have harnessed the benefits that these strong connections bring to all. To finish, uh, Mr. Chairman, with uh, one um, question, we heard Mr. Camara's earlier intervention um, and it reminded us of the partnership between Ireland's health sector and the government of Sudan uh, to strengthen the health professional training and development in the context of health worker mobility. This has facilitated an effect, the effective involvement of the Sudanese medical diaspora in Ireland uh, to support their own country's health system, including through education and training. And that's even more important now than it ever has been. Uh, I'd just like to find out the WHO Global Code of Practice on the International Recruitment of Health Personnel as an important instrument in this regard. Uh, so thank you, Mr. Camera, for outlining the work you've been doing in Mauritania uh, and the supports that were received from the European Union and the IOM. Uh, perhaps you could uh, tell us a bit more about what supports were there and as part of which scheme uh, did that fantastic initiative take place. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Cronin. Uh, next on my list is Ecuador. Gracias, señor thank you, Chair. I want to thank the panelists for their valuable contributions. Uh, Doubtless, we need to recognize the work of migrants during the pandemic in essential services, such as health, education, uh, food, and agriculture, among others. For Ecuador, migration has always been considered a, as a positive. It contributes to sustainable development through its economic, social, and cultural contributions in uh, countries uh, of arrival as well as country of origin that benefit both from remittances as well as the transfer of knowledge and entrepreneurship. Ecuador has carried out many measures uh, to promote inclusion of migrants. For example, we have uh, released uh, credit lines by banks to uh, facilitate access to financing. We also have an accelerated uh, uh, regularization process so that over 100,000 Venezuelans have been able to use basic services. This has also contributed greatly to their socioeconomic integration. We've also worked uh, to uh, recognize secondary and tertiary degrees, as well as their competencies in the, uh, on a par with uh, those of other countries. Nevertheless, uh, COVID-19 has had a negative uh, impact and has generated many challenges, such as uh, loss of life. And this has also uh, affected the implementation of Agenda 2030 and the sustainable development indicators. This pandemic has emphasized that the poor management of migratory flows degrades uh, work conditions, human rights violations, uh, and uh, it worsens uh, discrimination. For these reasons, uh, we think that it's absolutely vital to work uh, to create uh, medium and long-term policies that focus not only on short-term emergencies, but also allow to improve governance in a broader way. Similarly, uh, the pandemic also represents an opportunity to move forward consolidating the, the, the sustainable development goals. We should redouble our efforts to um, mitigate COVID's effect on remittances. And we need to understand that remittances are an essential financial services. And by 2030, we need to reduce to less than 3% the cost of these transactions. Ecuador has carried out uh, activities with the Chambers of Commerce and private banks uh, to uh, make remittance transfers more easy and economical. Last but not least, uh, I want to congratulate the Inter-American Development Bank uh, for
for the efforts deployed in the context of the current pandemic through their program that's based on capacity building in the context of migration. Ecuador is fully aware that capacity building, at, especially at an institutional level, as well as that of civil servants that deal with migration, as well as those in other entities that provide services to migrants, is absolutely essential to be able to strengthen national responses and have a better management of migratory flows. With all that in mind, I would like to ask what additional tools could be implemented to help states in the inclusion of migrants in their national programs, especially when it comes to socioeconomic recovery? That's the first question. And the second is, what initiatives have you foreseen to work closely with national authorities to strengthen the capacities of states when it comes to opening entrepreneur opportunities for migrants and their communities? Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. Uh, the next on my list is uh, Myanmar, that is online, after that we have Niger, after that France and Algeria, and that uh, exhausted my list. If someone else would like to take the floor, please notify me. Thank you. Now I would like to uh, make a link with the Myanmar. Did you have them online? The impact of COVID-19 on the economy and livelihood of migrant work is more prolonged and hard uh, prolonged and hard hitting than initially expected, as the pandemic is showing no sign of ending. At this time of crisis, migrant workers are facing with more difficulty. Each and every government must ensure to include migrants in their economic recovery plan. Myanmar shares the concern of difficulties migrant workers face. Thus, we encourage those who are stranded abroad to return. Myanmar has made every effort to bring back all citizen and to provide food and assistance to all returnees at the quarantine centers until they can go back to their homes in safety. The government has arranged daily flights for the Myanmar citizens who want to return to Myanmar during COVID-19. The government is keeping a record of the skills of returnees and creating job opportunities for them by initiating labor intensive projects in the construction sectors as well as cash for work schemes linked to rural development. We have been cooperating with IOM in our response to COVID-19. I'd like to take this opportunity to, to thank the IOM for its assistance. According to IMF, global economy is expected to shrink by 4.4%. Since no one knows how much the pandemic will weaken the global economy, Every country has to be prepared to face the economic slowdown or even economic downturn. Even the developed economies are hit by the pandemic. The least developed countries are no exceptions. Therefore, priority should be given to migrants from the least developed countries in extending assistance. This is a time for maximum cooperation. This unprecedented global challenge requires global cooperation that delivers actions in response to the challenges of migrants who can contribute to the achievement of sustainable development goals. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, next on my list is Niger. Please, floor is yours. Thank you. First of all, I want to reiterate my congratulations to the IOM for organizing this important event, which is a great opportunity to reflect and analyze on current migratory issues. I also want to congratulate the panelists for their presentations that have provided us with a wealth of information. Mr. Moderator, as you know full well, the contribution of migrants represents an important source of revenue for many countries, and this allows them uh, to benefit from their diaspora. For countries such as Niger, we need to uh, look at the, the funds provided by the diaspora, and we do not have exact uh, figures on this regard because they are family-based. Uh, however, they contribute in a great way uh, to the quality of life of many people in a very broad way. To better bear in mind uh, migration in all its perspectives and bearing in mind the global pact on migration, uh, Niger has developed a national policy and an action plan to facilitate migration uh, and uh, 
human uh, movement in a responsible and uh, regulated way. The strategic axis of our work is focused on benefiting from uh, the potential of, uh, of uh, migrants. We want uh, measures that can benefit the diaspora, the diaspora as well as uh, Niger itself. Uh, this will uh, this can be done through um, a restructuring of their activity. We will, we have created an investment fund for the diaspora. Centers that work uh, closely with local bands, uh, banks, and partner banks uh, to uh, help them with their uh, activities. Uh, we reviewed our investment le uh, legislation to provide them with uh, ease of access. Uh, and we also have a service that uh, compiles statistics on the diaspora with the correspondence abroad. Uh, despite all this, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, and despite all the efforts uh, we've made uh, to really uh, set up uh, sustainable development goals, will be challenged because of the current COVID crisis. Uh, its consequences affect all areas of activity in all states. Uh, and this worsens the vulnerability of all our populations, which is why my delegation considers that it's absolutely essential to strengthen measures aimed at protecting migrants and to inscribe and include their activities in all development uh, initiatives. Thank you. Merci. And now next uh, on my, our list is France. Oui. Uh, merci. Thank you, Chair. Uh, it was not my intention to take the floor. However, I do want to say that I was very much impressed by uh, this panel and uh, the panelists, and I just wanted to react quickly to what Dr. Kamara said, uh, which was truly admirable, as he uh, described uh, how he uh, had e expressed the work between the Monetarian, the Mauritarian Minister of Health and WHO uh, and the work of the diaspora. I had a question to ask him. I imagine that he's been able to do so, but has he been able to set up ties with a hospital center in Grenoble uh, in, uh, in, the, in the context of capacity building? That's my question. We also see that that's an, an example for both countries uh, of origin and uh, host countries that needs to be uh, uh, highlighted. Uh, in our policies, both in the medium and the long run. We need to look at the contributions that diaspora communities bring to all our countries. And I also wanted to say that uh, my delegation supports completely what Ecuador has said, uh, that we need to better include uh, migrants and uh, the diaspora in recovery plans. Thank you. Merci. Uh, next on our list, Algeria, please. Merci. Thank you. We want to thank uh, all the panelists uh, for the emphasis they have provided on uh, the sustainable development goals and how migrants can contribute to them, uh, both in countries of origin as well as uh, host uh, countries. We believe that the current context needs to be seized as an opportunity to uh, reinvigorate the international community uh, so that they can behave individually and uh, collectively towards the 2030 horizon. We'd like to re-emphasize the importance of universal health care, which would represent an absolutely essential component if we are going to reach goal three of that agenda, in other words, good health and well-being for all. Thus it is that we encourage working work between WHO and the IOM and other stakeholders so as to promote a global concerted approach to reduce the multidimensional challenge that the crisis of the uh, COVID face, uh, represents. Uh, this can only be done with proper implementation of Resolution 73.1, which addresses universal access to all products and health services in a safe and effective way to fight against the COVID-19 pandemic. The scope of this resolution is uh, also valid for the future vaccine against COVID-19, which should also be accessible to all without any discrimination whatsoever. We want to seize this opportunity to 
encourage donors uh, to redouble their support for IOM with flexible contributions uh, so that uh, the organization can carry out effective measures in that direction. Thank you. Thank you. Now I actually would like to return back uh, the moderation to Bettina, as I actually have several questions for the moderators, for Mr. Munoz, but also for Kamara here in the room. Uh, Bettina, please take over the moderation as of now. Is there? Yeah. Thank you very much. Yes, um, I understand that there um, were a few questions, um, especially addressed to Dr. Kamara. Um, maybe we we start with that package of questions and then um, turn to the next. There um, was a question by Franz just now um, asking about your ties with the hospital in Grenoble during um, your um, your service to, to your country in, in the COVID-19 crisis and how um, how your experience and um, your um, your relations to the hospital where you were employed in France um, helped you in um, performing um, your your duty in in your home country. And then the other question was about the clarification under which scheme um, exactly supported by IOM and also WHO, if I understood correctly this um this program actually um took place where you were supported to assist um your home country if you could address those questions um i would be grateful thank you you have the floor mr kamara we uh yes uh, hello again thank you for all your questions so let me take them uh, in the order they came. Ireland uh, asked about uh, the IOM support uh, to the uh, return program for the diaspora. Well, generally, the return uh, suggested is a three months uh, renewable period. It's true that in the context of Mauritania, only uh, I have been able to do three months. Uh, others have returned earlier after a month or a month and a half because it is very difficult to free oneself up for such a long period when you're involved in a clinical practice and simply carrying out care. It's very hard. So it's normally three months that can be renewed. I think that the program would like about 20 people to return. We've looked at different medical profiles, nurses also, and recently we've even had the profile of a head of hospital services. Um, at a high level uh, in Mauritania, and this contribution was very uh, well received. Uh, it's uh, a real challenge for us when it comes to restructuring uh, our activity. That is the major challenge. This is such a challenge that, for example, sometimes they're not even sure about the sort of equipment that is available in shops. So this is the sort of work that we've been able to go and set up. We've set up, for example, management softwares that looked at um, stocks and so forth. Uh, regarding the issue of remuneration, I think that that was uh, the heart of the matter. These are amounts that have nothing to do with the wages that are normally uh, received in Europe. Uh, it was uh, um, a symbolic amount, but an amount which allows us to live in the country of origin, which are countries in the south where the uh, expenses are not the same, uh, and they allow for uh, a reasonable life. So I think uh, the IOM uh, will be able to uh, explain this in greater detail. And I don't think there's anything to hide here, probably. The practitioners all came from Europe, mostly, uh, practically mostly all of them from France. I think that I answered the question. Now regarding uh, the question from France, uh, yes, the, the links between uh, Grenoble and uh, the Ministry of Health, we can imagine, but uh, the minister, of health really tends to focus on uh, emergencies. They don't have any long-term planning, really. They have a huge structural problem, which is why I wanted to express that they were very much interested in the arrival of uh, the head of a um, 
medical service that helped with planning. We haven't been able to liaise properly with ministries, but we've done so with WHO. For example, we had uh, special consultants come in from Spain, eight consultants actually. They're all uh, uh, ER specialists, uh, but at the end, uh, not all of them could come in because uh, COVID uh, kicked in. Uh, and so I often, well, I received a lot of uh, information, but uh, unfortunately in Grenoble also they had the closed restaurants and bars so they could mobilize themselves either. So I really want to thank the IOM for this initiative because I think that if they hadn't given us this little financial push, I wouldn't have been able to come because just like many others, just like many of you, I have family, children that go to school and so forth. I have to cover their expenses and we can't just up and leave and go. Even if you have the will and the support of your country, uh, we need that extra assistance. Unfortunately, our country has not been able to participate more heavily. But what I really want to emphasize very much uh, with IOM, I said, when we have a program such as this, and we need to involve the country, we need country ownership, uh, even if it's uh, uh, only with a, a symbolic amount, it's helpful. When we wanted to look at the Sustainable Development Goals, it was very hard to gather the data. We could uh, collate them, bring them together, and WHO provided a data manager that created an app uh, to uh, manage the data, but before that we didn't have access to the data because it was considered to be an NGO and WHO. But in the end, we managed to move forward. And whenever I was on vacation in Mauritania and I would talk to colleagues, I would use this opportunity. We recovered data that was ultimately shared and uh, nothing bad happened. Everything went smoothly, but I'm still looking to be able to uh, compile all the data from all hospitalized patients. So we need to make sure that this program is uh, financed by, by the IOM with uh, WHO's logistical support, which hosts us. But host countries also need to take ownership. They need to participate, even if it's only symbolically, so that uh, it, the bucket not stop with WHO, uh, with uh, the IOM, but also with the country. That is all I have to say. I think I managed to cover all your questions. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. I um, also noted a few questions from the government of um, Ecuador, and um, I do apologize that I did not really record them in full. Maybe I could ask um, the speaker from Ecuador to repeat the question and also who the questions are actually um, addressed to, so I could um, then direct them to um, an appropriate speaker, speaker on the panel. Thank you, Bettina. Uh, las preguntas de the questions were for Mr. Felipe Muñoz, and they are the following. The first is, what additional tools will be implemented by the bank to ensure that there's inclusion of migrants in national socioeconomic recovery plans? And the second, what initiatives have been uh, planned for working directly with national authorities to build capacity for the opportunities for entrepreneurship by migrants in their countries. Thank you. Thank you, Madam, for your clarifications. Over to you, Mr. Munoz, for the responses. Thank you. Okay. Um, muchas gracias. Thank you very much to the representative from Ecuador for the questions. First of all, I'd like to say is we've been working with Ecuador and seven other countries in the region in order to ensure that those countries through loans with the bank uh, will have beneficiaries included uh, that are migrants so that the receiving communities can obtain uh, this fund, which was authorized by the governors of the bank, that is to say the countries that are members of the bank. And with Ecuador in particular, we've been working on a project for social protection developed by the government of Ecuador in order to be able to ensure that part of this social protection network includes migrants. In the future, we are going to maintain and strengthen dialogue with the government of Ecuador through our representative in the Ecuador office with ministries of economy and foreign affairs 
to ensure that we support them in the processes that they have in the post-pandemic period so that we can provide them with tools and provide them with best cases from the region and from elsewhere in the world to help them in working on the integration process. Uh, we will work with the representative uh, to, um, we'll get in touch with the representative and I'll put uh, forward the link of the Inter-American Bank, Development Bank, so that others can find out more information about our work. Thank you. Thank you very much for the responses provided. Um, I would like to ask my co-moderator whether there might be any more requests for the floor at this point, as I do not see um, whether there's anyone who would like to speak. No, the, the list is, is, is exhausted. Then you can just wrap up. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so I'll make a quick, a brief attempt of um, formulating a few takeaways, salient points that I personally um, took from this very interesting um, and enriching session um, that may provide some food for thought for all of us in the international community um, focusing our engagement on migrants, um, on how we need to um, vamp up, redirect, adapt our responses in order to do justice um, to migrants agency and contribution to sustainable development, um, especially in the context of this crisis and beyond. So um, I gather that from all the, the speakers and, and inputs, also statements from the floor, there has been um, a resounding acknowledgement of the wealth and diversity of migrants' contributions to the sustainable development goals. Um, just to name a few examples, the workforce um, provided by many migrants around um, the world but also remittances, um, and they're not only the financial contributions migrants make, but also the human capital, the skills that are transferred. And one point in case was the very impressive um, case of Dr. Kamara, um, who supported his, his home country um, in strengthening um, the response to the global pandemic directly in being involved um, in responses at hospital level, but also with the Ministry of Health for um, sustainable improvements um, to, to the health system. But um, we all know um, and recognize that um, the contributions that migrants make around the world on a daily basis, they are heavily affected by the crisis and there is um, a risk that many of these contributions um, may drain out or um, may not translate into the effects that um, are direly needed in the situation because there are obstacles and barriers to their, their contributions. So um, agency and contributions of migrants to the response of the crisis in um, dealing with the crisis, with the various contributions they make, it doesn't come for free and not without um, support from different stakeholders in the international community. Um, so to sustain and um, increase the agency of migrants, to continue enabling their contributions during and after the crisis to um, the Sustainable Development Goals really requires um, a collective approach by the international community, um, basically um, with a two-pronged um, approach. So I gather from many of the inputs that first, we need to ensure that migrants around the world need to be um, protected and included in emergency responses. Um, this refers to legal, health, and also social protection 
in countries of origin, as well as, of course, also in countries of destination, um, if they stay in their destination countries, if they do return to their home countries, um, those protections need to be in place in the countries of, of origin. And so it's important to include migrants in response plans, also provide livelihood support, especially also um, to workers in the informal sector or irregular migrants, um, enabling everyone the health care and um, livelihood support that they require um, to, um, for their daily needs. So this is, this is important as a first step without um, this basic support and inclusion of migrants among um, all the other um, all the other groups in societies that are affected um, by, by the crisis, basically um, in accordance with the principle of leaving no one behind. Um, this is the first step that needs to, to be achieved in order to then um, promote and uh, multiply the, the agency and contributions of migrants. And there we've heard um, about different aspects like um, financial inclusion and financial literacy of migrants. So enhancing the development impact of remittances. And while remittances um, are sent on a regular basis, their impact can be supported and increased by different measures. And this crisis has shown how, um, how many of the challenges that were there before the crisis have been exacerbated, like access um, due to limited mobility in lockdowns. Um, and um, this elevating the importance of digital solutions. And whilst many of these solutions are there, but the gaps still exist, um, financial literacy is all the more important to make sure that migrants are aware of the different instruments, um, know how to use them and trust their, their effectiveness in um, transferring their, their funds to, to their loved ones um, at home. So, um, increasing financial inclusion and um, coming up with innovative approaches to enhance um, migrants' financial empowerment is, is of importance and an important lessons of, lesson of the crisis where different stakeholders need to come together. Another um, point in case would be um, em employability, um, making sure that um, skills and labor market needs are adequately matched and that um, processes, procedures are in place um, for adequate, fair and ethical recruitment. And there we've heard about the importance of bilateral um, agreements. And this is also true for, for social protection. And so um, be it upon return or um, upon potential remigration or for migrants that stay in, in their countries of destination, um, matching skills and labor market needs is, is of high importance. And linked to that, we've also heard about the importance of skills recognition and not only um, formal credentials, but actually also validating informal skills, um, which can be of essence in um, recovery in countries of origin and destination um, of, of this crisis. So um, my conclusions here are that the challenges um, or also the opportunities of increasing migrants' agency to enable their development contributions and particularly their contributions to achieving various development, sustainable development goals. Um, these challenges and opportunities are not new, but they have been in a way exacerbated by the crisis and a spotlight has been um, put on them and um, enhanced or in a way, uh, um, increased the, the relevance of uh, different approaches that have to be taken collectively by the international community in addressing those and um, multiplying the very positive um, effects on sustainable development um, by migrants um, around, around the world. So with this, I would like to thank um, all the panelists for their insightful presentations, um, views shared, and also um, for the enriching interactive discussion afterwards. 
the, the many ideas, um, experiences, best practices provided. And um, let's hope that um, with this food for thought, we can develop um, innovative, solid approaches that can increase migrants' agency. So thanks to everyone for contributing to this interesting session. And um, I, um, with this close, not only this session, but I understand also the first day of um, IOM's International Dialogue on Migration um, 2020 with um, an interesting outlook for a second day um, tomorrow. So thank you for staying with us um, beyond the original schedule and um, have a good evening or rest of the day wherever you're located. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Bettina. Thank you all. Uh, we had a three very ritual panels today, and all presentations that you, or panelist speeches that you heard today will be available. And also the recommendations that we received today, but also what could come up to your mind in the next seven days, you are free to send them and actually to propose what recommendations we should have out of the IDM 2020. Thank you, and see you tomorrow at 10 a.m. Thank you.